Once upon a time, when Charles Taze Russell was alive, he taught that in Revelation 9, the king of the abyss was Satan. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that the king of the abyss is Jesus. Let's read this. And it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So these words mean destroyer. So I'm in the book of Revelation from the Watchtower Society. Chapter 22, the first woe locusts. And under the locust plague today, it says reasonably, we could expect Joel's prophecy to have a final fulfillment in the time of the end. How true this has proved to be. At the Bible Students Convention at Cedar Point, Ohio, USA, September 1 to 8, 1919, a notable outpouring of Jehovah's Spirit activated his people to organize a global campaign of preaching. Of all professed Christians, they alone recognizing that Jesus had <clears throat> been enthroned as heavenly king, spared no effort in publishing abroad the good news. <clears throat> Their relentless witnessing in fulfillment of prophecy became as a tormenting plague to apostate Christendom. Revelation, written some 26 years after Jerusalem's destruction, also describes that plague. What does it add to Joel's description? Let us take up the record as reported by John. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to the earth, and the key of the pit of the abyss was given him. This star is different from that at Revelation 8.10 that John saw in the act of falling. He sees a star that had fallen from heaven and that now has an assignment with respect to this earth. Is this a spirit or a fleshly person? The holder of this key of the pit of the abyss is later described as hurling Satan into the abyss. So he must be a mighty spirit person. At Revelation 9.11, John tells us that the locusts have a king, the angel of the abyss. The angel of the abyss. Both verses must refer, must refer to the same individual, since the angel holding the key of the abyss would logically be the angel of the abyss. Hmm. And the star must symbolize Jehovah's appointed king since anointed Christians acknowledge only the one angelic king, Jesus Christ, Michael the Archangel. 
The account continues, and he opened the pit of the, uh, of the abyss, and smoke ascended out of the pit, as the smoke of a great fiery furnace, and the sun was darkened, also the air, by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke locusts came forth upon the earth, and authority was given them, the same authority as the scorpions of the earth have. Scripturally, the abyss is a place of inactivity, inactivity, even of death. The small band of Jesus' brothers spent a short time in such an abyss of relative inactivity at the end of the First World War, 1918 to 1919. So, Revelation 9 was fulfilled in 1919. But when Jehovah poured his spirit upon his repentant servants in 1919, they swarmed forth to meet the challenge of the work that lay ahead. As John observes, the release of the locusts is accompanied by much smoke. Like the smoke of a great furnace. That is how it proved to be in 1919. It's proven, folks. The situation darkened for Christendom and for the world in general. Jehovah's Witnesses were here. The release of these uh, locusts, the class, was actually a defeat for Christendom's clergy who had schemed and plotted to kill the kingdom work for good and who now rejected God's kingdom when uh, Rutherford and seven other contemporaries were thrown in prison for a short while. Evidence of a smoke like um, Paul started to spread over apostate Christendom as that locust band was given a divine authority and began to exercise it in proclaiming powerful judgments, uh, judgment messages. Christendom's sun, her appearance of enlightenment, suffered an eclipse and the air became thick with declarations of divine judgment as the ruler of the authority of the air of this world was shown to be Christendom's God. The torment lasts for five months. Is that a relatively short time? Not from the point of view of a literal locust. Five months describes the normal lifespan of one of these insects. Therefore, it is for as long as they live that the modern day locusts keep stinging God's enemies. Moreover, the torment is so severe that men seek to die. True, we have no record that any of those who were stung by the locusts actually tried to kill themselves. No, mm, no record of that. But the expression helps us to picture the intensity of the torment, as though by the relentless assault of scorpions. It is like the suffering foreseen by Jeremiah for those unfaithful Israelites who would be scattered by the Babylonian conquerors and for whom death would be preferable to life. Why is it granted to torment these ones in a spiritual sense and not to kill them? This is an initial woe in the exposing of the lies of Christendom and her failures. But only later, as the Lord's day progresses, will her death-like spiritual state be fully publicized. It will be during a second woe that a third of the men are killed. And yes, that has been fulfilled. Hmm. This is just too funny. Too funny.